Hallelujah. We're going to start a new series this morning, and actually it kind of ties in with everything else, but it's called Faith, the Law of Change. Faith, the Law of Change. And um, this morning, while we were after praise and worship, I, I believe the Lord had a word to give, but I didn't know where to go with it or if it was for then, and the word was swish. And I thought, well, I need more than swish. And anyway, as I was sitting there later, it kind of ties in with what we've been saying. When you think of, of um, take um, a piece of clothing, and it needs to be washed. So you pick it up and you swish it through the water. And you take it out, you hang it up, and lo and behold, it's still dirty. It really hasn't changed anything. In fact, it's made, us wor made it worse. And sometimes this is what we do with the word of God. We just go and swish through it. We think, well, I've been there, I've done that, and you sort of swish through it, just sort of read something, give it a quick glance, and you think, why hasn't anything changed? Why hasn't it changed? Because actually it says that you're clean through the washing of the water of the word. Because the problem is we've swished our way through a lot of times, through the word, through church, whatever, and we haven't washed ourselves in the water. We haven't stayed in the word long enough, the water of the word, to get changed. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if we don't spend enough time, we're not going to get washed. So this is called faith, the law of change. We've studied many things leading up to this, the enemy within, which is mental ascent. And we go, oh yeah, I know that, but we haven't gotten it from our head to our heart. And so we realize that's not going to work. We found out that we can have a hardened and unbelieving heart because we're more attuned to the natural things than the spiritual things. So last week we looked at the purpose of Jesus coming. And I want to start with Genesis chapter 1 because uh, that's the beginning. We always may as well start with the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, now notice God is saying something. He said, let us make man in our image. Now you have to understand the us there includes Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because in John chapter 1 it says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. It also says in Hebrews that the Word Jesus was there and all things were made by him and through him. So when it says God said let us, we have to realize that Jesus was present at the same time. So God says Elohim, which is plural, said let us make man in our image after our likeness. Image and likeness. Image and likeness. Image. Likeness. They're two different things. They're not the same thing. The image of something is an exact duplication in kind. And likeness is like, meaning operating the same way. We have to ask ourselves, what image do I have on the inside of me? What is my image? God said, let us make man in our image and have them operate the way we do. Is your image on the inside like God, like Jesus? After our image, and let them have dominion. So we see a dominion there. <clears throat> and how do we exercise dominion? God said. God said, God said, and kings decree a thing, and so God said. That's the way God took dominion. Verse 28, and God blessed them. God empowered them to prosper. What is the blessing? Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, have dominion. That was the first commandment God gave to Adam. And that's one of our first commandments, is to be a blessing. <clears throat> People are looking for employment for the purpose of making money. 
Our reason for work should be so we can extend the gift God's put in us to be a blessing out there. We're called to be a blessing. Because we have been blessed, as Abraham was blessed to be a blessing to the nations. So God blessed them. He said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and have dominion. Verse 7 of chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That means a speaking spirit like God. The likeness of God. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. The law of change took place. By grace through faith. Faith, the law of change. Without faith, there wouldn't have been a change. And that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Both the faith and the grace are the gift of God. Grace, God's power beyond our ability. God's willingness to use his power. God's unmerited favor. He favored us with Jesus. Gave us the word, according to Romans chapter 10. We heard the gospel. Faith came. The faith came because of the word of God. God's word is the seed bucket of faith. When it's planted, faith springs forth. We're responsible for planting it. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're saved by grace through faith, and both are a gift. How long did it take you to get saved? Once you heard the word, you believed in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. As I said last week, if you don't believe Jesus is raised from the dead, your God is dead, and he's no different than any other God out there. What makes our God different is he is alive. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. He is alive and well. As he is, so are we in this world. And then you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. And then you make him your Lord. How long, once you believed in your heart, confessed with your mouth, how long did it take you to get saved? seconds, a blink. Now it also says at that time we were healed. Saved is sozo, which means healed, delivered, set free, prosperous. So right at that moment, we immediately received all those things. And yet we're struggling and working for it. Right at that moment when we spoke those words, the law of change took place. Because faith is the law of change. Without faith, nothing will change. Without faith, it's not going to change. 2 Corinthians 5.17 2 Corinthians 5.17 We're going to be reviewing a bit here to get into some of the things that we're going to look at with the law of change. There are laws... Brother Dennis Burke, when he was here, he spoke on four laws. Brother Mark Hankins, when he was here, he spoke on three laws. One of the laws is a law of faith. When you look at faith, it has to be a law of change, because without faith, nothing's going to change. Jesus came out of the grave because of faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man... Is there anybody, anything, any person excluded in the any man? Nobody's excluded. So if any man be in Christ, and how do you get in Christ? We found out we get born again. So this applies to any person that believes in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confesses with their mouth Jesus is Lord, is one of these any mans. So if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's a new species that never existed before. You become a new species that never existed before. You have a new spirit. 
A new spirit, not a recreated spirit. A new spirit, something that didn't exist before. In Ezekiel, God says, I'll take out the stony heart. So obviously we had a spirit before. But it was stony in that it was dead to God and alive to the devil. I'll take out of you the stony heart, the heart that's cold, that is unresponsive, that's void of love, that's void of faith, void of the likeness of God, and I will put within you a new heart. The minute you're born again, you receive that new heart. Hallelujah. That's enough to shout about. That is a glorious, marvelous thing. Behold, all things become new. So you have got to get to the place of the old way of seeing yourself is over. It's done. But we keep looking at the old self. We keep trying to resurrect the old self. Why? Because we have not gotten an image on the inside of us of who we really are. We don't see ourselves as God sees us. We don't see ourselves as God sees us. Verse 21, for he hath made him, Jesus, sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Everybody say, I've been made the righteousness of God. You're not going to become righteous. You might become doing righteous deeds. You become holy, but you're made the minute you're born again. You're made righteous. That's who you are. The mirror translation says, this is the divine exchange, glory to God. He who knew no sin embraced our distortion. He appeared without form. This was the mystery of God's prophetic poetry. He was disguised in our distorted image. And we can find this in Isaiah 53. He was disguised in our distorted image, marred with our iniquities. He took our sorrows, our pain, our shame to his grave and birthed our righteousness in us. He took our sins and we became his righteousness. If God made you righteous, you can't get any more righteous than you already are. If you're trying to make yourself righteous, the Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags. Quit trying to make yourself righteous. You have to accept the fact that God made you righteous. Amen. God did it. Yeah. Quit trying to work to be righteous. You might, we have to uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that mean? Not to become righteous but his way of doing things and being right. God's way of operating, which we saw in Genesis chapter 1, didn't we? In his image and likeness. God's way of doing and being right. Being a speaking spirit like God. That's righteous. Calling those things that be not as though they are until they become, like Abraham did, that's righteous. Because when Abraham did that, God reckoned that to him as righteousness. Somebody says, well, I can't do that. That's lying, and I don't feel like doing it, and it's too hard. You're not walking in your right standing with God. Because God said to call those things that be not as though they are until they become, and when you do that, you will get that image on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, you hear all this stuff of time to come out, of people coming out of the closet. Let me tell you, it's time for the redeemed of the Lord to say so and come out of the closet. We are the answer to every problem this earth has. Because we're walking in the kingdom and we're here to be a blessing. To be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish. Replenish the waste places. To give people a hope. We became his righteousness. We were made righteous. Romans 8, 29. Glory to God. I don't know. You just get excited. I know you probably all heard this before, but faith comes by hearing. And let's just keep hearing and hearing and hearing. Get that inner image on the inside of us. Doesn't matter what anybody says to you, what anybody tells you. 
what they accuse you of, what they don't accuse you of. Just find out what your heavenly Father says about you and just go with it. Just go with it. Just go with it. Everybody's been accused. You know what? When people accuse you, they're lying. But if they come to you and say, here's a word from the Lord for you. Here's what the Bible says. If you talk you're unworthy and somebody says, oh, you know what? I understand how you feel about that. They're lying to you. Because that's not a truth. The truth is you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And nothing, nothing shall be impossible to him who believes. Say nothing Nothing. shall be impossible impossible. to me. Because I'm a believer. I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus is Lord. And he's my Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's time to declare, be bold. Have it said about us what was said about the disciples. They've turned the world upside down. Well, it's time we don't turn the world upside down, but we turn it right side up. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's time for it to be said. It's time for them to tremble in fear when they see us coming, the way they trembled in fear when the Jews started coming into the promised land. Glory to God. The devil's got to tremble whenever you take a step out of bed. Because he knows you're walking in the favor of God and something good is going to happen to you today. Expect, expect the impossible. If you expect the possible, it's no big deal. Anybody gets the possible. But only God's kids get the impossible. And nothing shall be impossible to them who believe. So you think it's impossible, but if you believe, it's quite possible. Hallelujah. Are you in Romans 8, 29 yet? All right, let's read it. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, if people want to argue about whether Jesus actually died and went to hell. Here's a scripture. He's the firstborn. But if there's a firstborn, there's many other born. He's the firstborn among many brethren. And we're to be conformed to his image. What is that image? Go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. God said, let's make man in our image and likeness. That is your image. That's God's plan A. He hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. That was God's plan from the beginning, and through Jesus, he got it back. But this predestined, people say, well, God predestined you to be conformed into the image of God. This one, he predestined to go to hell. I don't know if any of you heard that. I was told I was one of the ones predestined to go to hell by a pastor. That was cool. It was interesting anyway. He predestined, planned beforehand that you are his workmanship and he pre-planned for every person to have a gift and a calling in their life. That's what he predestined. He predestined for every person to be conformed to the image of Jesus. But some people just don't want to. Their want to is in, in place. I don't know, have any of you, you know, may have said it yourself, heard someone say, well, I just don't want to. Well, it's time with the body of Christ to get our want to in order. Our want to. Because he, God sees us seated with Christ in heavenly places, whether you want to be there or not, that's where you are. That's where your authority is. The mirror translation of that He predestined, no, pardon me, he predesigned and engineered, now you go back to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. He predesigned and engineered us from the start to be jointly fashioned in the same mold and image of his son. Say, I'm in the same mold as Jesus. 
an image, image. We are made in the image and likeness of God. Now we're to be in the image of his son. Image. We're going to get into that image situation later down the road in I don't know what week, but we will get there and we will start expanding the image. But we're to be in his image. According to the exact blueprint of his thought. You know what? Before the foundation of the world, God drew a blueprint for you. Perfect. One of a kind blueprint. Hallelujah. He has a blueprint. And you know, hope is the blueprint for our faith. Hope draws out that blueprint. Blueprint of his thought. We see the original an extended pattern of our lives preserved in his son. Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to my Father. That's his blueprint for us. Back to the Garden of Eden. Hallelujah. God's plan. We got his teaching out there. God's original plan for man when Jesus came up out of that grave victorious took the keys of death hell and the grave from Satan brought his blood before the judge of the universe and put it on the heavenly mercy seat and God accepted it and said it was good enough we got back to God's original plan for man Now, I know you all know this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. We are only this in Jesus. We are not this without him. So we can't get thinking that we can just, and I know like, you know, the Tower of Babel. God said anything they imagine won't be impossible to them, so he brought confusion. It hits a point. You can't get any farther than this in your natural. Because God created man to have an overlord. And either Jesus will be your overlord or Satan will be. It's one or the other. That's the way God created man. So without Jesus, you are now having Satan as your overlord. So I want to make it clear. We're not talking about we're so great because of us. We're so great because of Jesus and what he made us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So, our lives are preserved in his son. 2 Corinthians 3.18. We're going through all this to see some things because we, to, to develop later faith, the law of change, you see what we're reading, we need faith for that change to happen. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. The mirror says, blueprint of God's likeness displayed in human form. So we're changed, we look in the glass. James chapter 1, I believe it is, talks about the glass. The word of God is the glass. If you want to know what you're like, look in the word. Look to Jesus. Jesus and the word are one. That's what we're like. And so it says here in Corinthians, open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. We see ourselves in the word. Every time you read the word, we see Jesus, but you're in him. So you should see how God's made you. An exact duplication in kind of Jesus. And yes, Jesus is the firstborn. Yes, I understand that. But we're second or third. We're joint heirs with Jesus. We need Jesus. He's our Lord and Savior. He paid the price for us. We couldn't do it. He was without sin. We were born in sin. 
So let's never ever separate ourselves, getting the idea that we don't need Jesus because we've gotten so far that we don't need him. Without him, we're zero. Let's just remember that. Without Jesus, we have nothing. Without Jesus, we're walking in the natural. In, with, without Jesus, it says that Satan is the god of this world system. Without Jesus, we're operating under Satan and the world system. It's only with Jesus, in Jesus, and it's all because of Jesus. So let's never forget that. So when I'm talking about this, we see ourselves in Jesus, not apart from him. Hallelujah, that's the power of the cross. Glory to God. So the mirror says, again, the blueprint of God's likeness displayed in human form. Look in the world, in the word, to see your real self. We are changed into the image of God from glory to glory. Now, you know in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all. We're anointed with that same power. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, we have that same power. And in that verse, there are the visitations, demonstrations, and manifestations of God. Wherever you go, there should be the visitation of God, because we're the body of Christ. So God in us is visiting people. There should be a demonstration of his love and his mercy and his glory. And there should be a manifestation of his presence and his power. Hallelujah. But if we have the wrong inner image, we won't be able to go and take that to the lost and dying world. Amen? So now let's look at Colossians 3.10. Where, where these scriptures are to show that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And because of Jesus, we once again can get to that place, being in the image and likeness of God. Colossians 3.10. Hallelujah. Um, now, here's something we do. Put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So we're to put on the new man. How do we put on the new man? Through knowledge. Through the word of God. We see what the new man is supposed to be like. And we put that on by putting the word on, by speaking the word. The mirror says we stand fully identified in the new creation. Renewed in knowledge according to the pattern of the exact image of our creator according to the exact image of our creator so we've got to stop thinking I'm just an old sinner saved by grace you were the minute you're saved you're no longer a sinner you may miss the mark you may sin meaning doing something contrary to the word of God But when it says I, you're a sinner saved by grace, it's talking about the sin nature. You have the sin nature of Adam passed through the blood. That's what we all had. We saw that last week. And we got saved by grace through faith. And now our spirits are brand new with the image of God. And that's how we have to see ourselves. Renewed into the exact image of our creator. Identification with Christ. So here's how we have to not be apart, but identify with Christ. We have to have, see that we have a complete union with him in his substitutionary sacrifice. The legal side of that, and we've talked about the legal and the experiential, the legal and what you experience. The legal side is what God did in Christ for us 
from the time he went to the cross until he sat down on the right hand of the Father. The vital or the experiential, what's working in your life, part of the identification of the redemption, is what the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, is doing in us now. What the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, is doing in us now. And what the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, the amount of word and place you give to the Word of God is the amount of work that the Holy Spirit can do inside of you. No more, no less. No more, no less. That's it. No word, nothing the Holy Spirit can work in our lives. Christ became one with us in sin, and we've already seen the scriptures on this, so I'm summarizing it. Christ became one with us in sin that we might become one with him in righteousness. Now that's covenant talk, right? He took my sin, I take his righteousness. Covenant. It's, covenant is always between a stronger and a weaker. He's the stronger, I'm the weak. He's got the righteousness I've got the sin. He takes my sin, and I take his righteousness. An exchange. That's that divine exchange we read about in the scriptures. He became as we were so that we might be as he is now. And in 1 John it says, as he is, so are we in this world. This world, not the world to come. But as he is, how is Jesus? Is he sick? Is he poor? Is he beaten down? Is he righteous? As he is, so are we in this world. Now. Today. He became one with us in death that we might become one with him in life. We've got to remember, Jesus did not go to hell for himself. He didn't have to go. He didn't have sin. He went there for us. He went there for you and me. Say, Jesus went to hell, became sin, became sick because of me. It was my sin, my sickness, my disfigurement. My sin nature that he took so he could give me his righteousness. The divine exchange. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's look at what happened. When this happened, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. Glory to God. We're covering a lot here, but it's all to get this idea of image. The image we're supposed to have. Ephesians 2, 6. Well, you know what? Let's, let's read this a little bit differently. We're going to read some of chapter 1 and then jump down to verse 6. Um, Verse 20, which he, Ephesians 1, 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and sat him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where? Far above. Everybody say far above. Far above. Say I am seated I with Christ Jesus. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And all things have been put under my feet. Come on, all things have been put under my feet because I'm seated with Jesus in heavenly places. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory. Well, isn't that what the scripture says? Hallelujah. That's where we are. Because of us? No. Because of him. But let's get rid of the pride. Thinking, well, what did I do to earn this? I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, and I've got to, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do that. 
So what? Jesus did it. And let's humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he will give us grace when we need it. Hallelujah. This is so important because I was listening to um, the minister's conference, Brother Dennis Burke's teaching, and he was teaching on the four laws. But one of the things he said, as, as most of us know here, Vicki, his wife's sister, died of cancer just a short while ago. And so they had been ministering to her, and just a couple of weeks, or it could have been a couple of months, before his sister, Bonnie, went home to be, I think her name was Bonnie, but anyway, went home to be with the Lord. Dennis was in California and went to see her, and she was in a hospital bed at home. And through the process of talking, she finally says to Dennis, now they had been sharing with her, she had been listening to CDs, and she says to Dennis, do you think I'm going to heaven? And Dennis goes, yeah, I think you're going to heaven. Because he said he based that on her confession from before and everything else. And so he says to her, but um, it doesn't really matter what I think. What do you think? Do you think you're going to heaven? And she says, well, she wasn't sure. And she started listing off all the things she had done wrong. And it started going, and, and it was a pretty long list. And some of it was way back before she even got born again. So Dennis stopped her and said, Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? She said, Oh, yes, I do. I do. With all my heart, I do. He says, Do you believe Jesus is Lord? She said, oh, yes, I do. He says, have you made Jesus your Lord? She said, oh, yes, I have. And Dennis said, then none of that is relevant. It doesn't matter. It's all gone. What happened way before you were born again and what happened one hour ago is not relevant. And there's a lot of believers that get hung up in that thinking they're not good enough. When you find out you're doing something opposite to the word of God, sinning against the word, doing something the word says not to do, repent. Quit doing it. You've got grace to help you not to do it anymore. But that's not what determines your eternal destination. And this is why I'm saying we've got to get the image of God on the inside of us. How could she possibly believe for healing if she wasn't even sure that she was going to heaven? How? This is vital. Because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And he will come and accuse you day and night. And there's two ways he does it. One, he will pound you that you've missed it and you're not good enough to walk in the grace and the glory. You're not good enough to be a help to God. And the other way he will get to you is by when you're doing something, and we saw that on Wednesday night about sin. And you look at it and you're splitting hairs and it's a little gray. And you're not sure if you should do it or not. And Satan says, oh, that's not, that's not a real big deal. Don't forget, you're saved by grace. You'll go to heaven. And it'll destroy your testimony. Anything of doubt is not of faith. And if you're not sure, the minute you ask, well, I'm not sure, I don't think it's wrong, quit it. Just cut it out. If you're not sure, don't do it until you're sure. Don't mess around. Don't give Satan a foothold. There can't be anything so important out there that if you're not sure, you're going to do it. Cut it out. Stop it. It's just that simple. Repent does not mean going around 180 degrees. Repent doesn't mean, oh God, forgive me. I'm so sorry I did that. Oh, good. Glory to God, I'm forgiven. You do it again. Oh, God, forgive me. I'm sorry I did that. And you do it again. There's no repentance. The Bible talks about repentance. 
And you repent by saying what God says about you. And that's what 1 John 1, 9 talks about, saying the same thing God says about you. I confess what he says about me. And I'm doing this. But I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And I walk in truth. And I walk in holiness. And I've got the image of God on the inside of me. I am not going to go there. I don't need that pleasure of the world. I don't need it. I don't need it. Hallelujah. We're raised with him. Seated with him. And when you think about it, it says here in 1, let's pick it up, 22, and hath put all things under his feet. His feet are in the body. He's been made to be head. We are his body. You read in there and it'll tell you we're his body. The feet are in the body. So the feet are in the church, the feet are us. Given him to be the head over all things to the church, the body, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. The body is the fullness of Jesus and we're to fill the earth. The head goes into the body and we are filled with the fullness of him, his image on the inside of us, the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the inside of us, the word working mightily on the inside of us. We are his fullness. And if the body doesn't get in line doing what God's called them to do, Jesus is not going to be full. Jesus won't be full. That's what it says here. Which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. It's his body being full that causes Jesus to be full in this earth. Hallelujah. Back to we're made in his image and likeness. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.